You'd think a person who lived in a haunted house would be used to the paranormal, but skinwalkers are not the paranormal. They are equivalent to a witch and a monster. They were once medicine men, but what happens is they turn to a more darker side. In order to be a skinwalker, they must become a medicine man, or already be a medicine man. Then, they have to kill a member of their family. It's just like in The Conjuring, how the lady who had her baby sacrificed it to Satan when it was only 7 years old. I always thought of it like that. Since medicine men are considered holy and healers in the Navajo Nation, skinwalkers can chant curses, use rituals to fatally harm a person, sometimes they blow powdered bones to a person, that way they can become sick and left untreated and die. They are also known to shapeshift into anything. If you ever drive on the long roads at night on the reservation, many people are scared to look out of the window and fear that they will see a shadow running alongside their vehicle. They are evil. They are real, and I encountered one of their houses. Every year, my mom's side of the family has an annual family campout in Sale Woods on the Navajo Reservation. We camp out at my grandpa's sheep camp. The whole camp has a circle clearing, so we are able to set up our tents. That year, I brought along my cousin from my dad's side, Gabby. This was the time I was youthful, energetic, and could run around for hours without feeling like I was dying. At dusk, me and Gabby were playing hide and seek in the woods. It wasn't far out, it was just enough that we could see the campsite still. At the time, I guess I wasn't concerned about danger, because I thought that since my whole family was less than a mile away, they could reach me if I was in danger. As the day got darker, we were ready to head back. When I noticed a light in the clearing, something felt weird, as though the air got heavy. The woods now seemed like it had a gray atmosphere. The trees felt like they had no life, and that the leaves seemed brittle and brown. Everything looked the same, mind you, but I felt as through the woods somehow changed. When I started walking towards the light, I came across the house. The structure seemed more as a small hut. Leaning against a big tree, it was facing the opposite of east, which I thought was weird since most houses or hogans have the door facing east so that it will get hit with the first light of dawn in the morning. The structure was also made of nothing but tree bark and inside seemed to be lined with fur, but there was a little open window where the light was coming from. There seemed to have been drawings in the side of the hut, drawn with black charcoal. Me and my cousin paused as we looked at the house, contemplating what to do. I wanted to get closer and face this house because I didn't want to lay awake at night, wondering what it was. As I got closer, my cousin started to have this panic feeling overwhelm her. She kept asking me to leave and run to the campground. I didn't want to, but that was when the light was blown out. At that moment, I realized someone was in there. We both ran back to the campground, and I was shaking, constantly looking back. That didn't help because I kept thinking I was seeing a dark shadow hiding among the trees. When we reached the camp area, we told my sister what had happened. She scolded us, saying that there might have been skinwalkers in the woods. Since last week, as my uncle was getting the campground ready, there had been a signing of a mountain lion walking around the camp. Of course, the next morning I went back to the forest to see if the structure was still there. It wasn't nothing, as though we had imagined the whole thing. I walked around the entire place, staying close to the hiking trail as to not get lost, and I couldn't find anything. When I was a freshman in high school, I met Alex. Now, ten years later, I couldn't tell you why I was so drawn to him, or why I got so attached. He was homely and odd and quite frequently smelled bad. There was a darker undercurrent that ran below his surface, and I thought I saw unspoken sadness that matched mine, and maybe as a naive 15 year old, I had the stereotypical we could save each other from our pain bullshit fantasy. He wasn't the only boy giving me attention, but he was the one I wanted. Every time I would start to pull away and give up because he was clearly uninterested, he would pop up, calling me cute and making comments about how seeing me brightens his day. Then he would be back to persuading someone else. I was 15 and naive and hurt, but still finally had enough, so I decided I was done. He caught wind of this and ended up asking me to be his girlfriend later the same day. I was caught off guard but thought, yes, finally, 
he must have just needed time to make a move. He and I dated for two years, and he was a hurricane the entire time. One example, his phone would be off for days at a time, he rarely went to school, and I just wouldn't hear from him. I would finally call his mom because I was worried about not hearing from him at all for three, four, five days, and she would tell me she hadn't seen him either. When he finally turned his phone back on, he would spit venom at me and call me a crazy cunt because I spammed his phone. I would be in tears trying to explain I was worried because I hadn't heard from him in days and neither had his mother. And then he would call me a few other names and hang up on me and turn his phone off. The abuse came in many ways, but disappearing and then cussing me out and calling me names when I voiced how uncomfortable it made me, that was his favorite. I kept trying to break up with him, but whenever I did that, Suddenly, he was calling me crying and saying I was the love of his life and he was going to kill himself if I left him. After two years, I finally had enough and I ended it for good. I told him I was done. I ignored his threats of suicide. He kept begging for me to take him back. School was out for the summer so he couldn't find me there, which meant he kept showing up at my house. Afternoon, evening, middle of the night, it didn't matter. He would toss bits of bark at my bedroom window. He would sit out there for a long time trying to get me to talk to him. I didn't know what to do. I thought he would give up and that it would be okay soon. One day I was walking home from work. I was a block away from my house and Alex came sliding up next to me in his car, pleading with me to talk to him. I told him I had nothing more to say. Then let me talk, please, he begged. He was crying. I had no intention of getting back together with him but I still hated seeing him hurt. I agreed to let him say what he wants so he could get closure. I sat in the car and told him to talk. He started babbling incoherently and kept trying to make me feel bad for abandoning him. I told him the conversation was over and I was leaving. He locked the doors, and as I went to manually push the lock on my door up, he grabbed my arm and told me I wasn't leaving. I panicked. I smacked him and shoved him away from me and scrambled out of the car and ran the rest of the block home. He continued to lurk, spanned my inbox, drove by my house and place of employment. I ended up rebounding and started dating someone new. He was Alex's complete opposite and made me feel happy and light. However, once Alex caught news of this, he flipped out. He went ballistic. The calls and texts increased both in frequency and in a level of mania. He started hanging out right outside of the store I worked at. It was a small store in the mall so I could see him, just standing there staring in at me. Management had to call mall security a few times, but he always came back. Eventually, his text got threatening. He started saying things about how he hoped my new boyfriend was prepared, and he said that he was willing to go to jail to have me. My mom panicked and believed that I was on the verge of being kidnapped or assaulted. We had gone to the cops a couple of times, but they said they couldn't do anything because he technically hadn't broken any laws. We took the threatening messages to them, and they said they would start to file a restraining order and go warn him that he couldn't go near me or talk to me or he was in violation of the order of protection. He kept showing up anyway. One night, around midnight, the doorbell rang. My mom was confused and asked if I was expecting anyone. I told her no. She opened the door and there, on the front step, was a card, a rose, and a burning candle. We glanced up and down the street and didn't see anyone. We were immediately spooked because there wasn't enough time for him to ring the doorbell and get out of sight, unless he was hiding in the trees along the house. This went on for a while. He kept following me and showing up at my work, which means he kept getting visited by the cops and his friends even got involved and started threatening me for what I was doing to him. Eventually, the order of protection was placed, and all at once, everything stopped. My paranoia and fear and jumpiness lasted for a long time after that. This happened in my fourth year at university. I had moved around abroad on the exchange year and was living in student accommodation in England. The building was an old factory converted in student housing. It had four floors and was square with a courtyard in the center. Each floor had a connecting corridor that would run from one side of the building to the other. 
The corridor was then separated in eight self-contained flats of four bedrooms. The separations between the flats were locked fire doors. These doors could only be opened by breaking a fire seal or by having a master key which would set off an alarm, as experienced in the first few weeks when students were trying to sneak into the other flats without having to go through the courtyard. Each fire door had a seat through a window from one flat to the other. It was sometimes in the spring break of 2005. All the local students had gone home for Easter, but I couldn't afford the plane ticket back to visit my parents. I was alone on my floor, except for a few students in another aisle of the building who were sharing a flat together. I was actually relishing having the whole flat for myself. Without the endless parties and general mess that comes with shared student accommodation, Actually, having time to write my dissertation, and maybe grab a decent night's sleep without anyone screaming or switching corridor lights in the middle of the night. The bedroom doors had big gaps underneath and the light could wake you. And as my bedroom was next to the fire door, dividing the flats, I could enjoy my flatmates and neighbors antics. That evening, I had watched a movie on my computer. Probably Silence of the Lambs or Big Fish as these were the only two DVDs that I owned at the time. Then I turned off the computer and went to bed. Now, I could remember the whole floor is empty of students. No lights coming from the corridors or kitchens. No lights in my bedroom and blackout curtains drawn. My flatmates are with their family and there is no noise in the building. I'm confident that I have locked the main entrance and my bedroom door. And I do not need to worry about the fire doors as they are locked and alarmed. I feel safe. How wrong I was. In the middle of the night, I wake up and feel a presence in the room. It's hard to describe as I actually can't see it, but on instinct, I do not move or make a noise. I hold my breath and wait. Now I have a tinnitus, so I cannot hear faint noises, but trust me, I didn't need to hear. I actually felt the person in the room move, and I knew, just knew, that they were standing right next to my bed. Fear takes over. I stand up on my bed and scream the loudest and biggest scream that I can muster. I'm ready to pounce on this person who has their back to me as I can now make out from the faint light coming from a tiny torch, but they are faster than me. In one jump, they reach my bedroom door. And with another jump, they are out, through the fire door. I grab my phone on my bedside table and run out of my bedroom, unlock my flat door and sprint directly to the security office, a block away, in my pajamas and bare feet. I talk to the security guard on duty, who doesn't believe me. Through the fire door, you say. But the alarm didn't go off. I still make him come back to the flat and check. The fire door is unlocked, and the security guard proceeds to lock it again then open it with his master key, no alarm sounding. I'll have the engineer check it in the morning. I also made him check the CCTV, the cameras, but we couldn't see anything or anybody running out of the courtyard. Go back to bed, love. Must have been a nightmare. I know it wasn't a nightmare. How do you explain the fire door being unlocked? And I know I had locked the bedroom door. And if no one exited the building, did it mean that the person was still within the building? From that point on, and until the end of the academic year, I did not sleep without my phone on me and I pushed my chair against my bedroom door to prevent anyone opening it. I also learned to love my noisy flatmates. It meant I wasn't alone. I never found out who it was. My flatmates thought it was a previous student with a double of the flat keys looking for loot and what they thought would be an empty building and sometimes joked that it was a secret admirer who had come to observe me in my sleep. We'll never know, and honestly, I prefer not to. This happened many years ago, when I was 14 or 15. Though I and my siblings grew up in Wyoming, my parents are both from Michigan, and we still have a buttload of family on both sides who live there. This land, which is still home to several of my aunts, uncles, and cousins, has always been referred to as the farm, even though we haven't been farmers for a long time. Every other summer, my family would take a trip to Michigan to visit the farm, and my siblings and I were always really excited because we had lots of cousins around our own age to play with. 
and the parents would just kind of let us run wild all summer. This particular summer, I had met a boy through my cousins that I really liked. We hung out for a few weeks, made out awkwardly a few times, then he promptly broke up with me for another girl. I was absolutely devastated in that totally melodramatic way that only lovesick teenagers can be, and I spent most of the next day crying and moping around and generally annoying my cousins. My cousins decided that something must be done to cheer me up, so they decided that we should grab the tent and some sleeping bags and spend the day in the woods on my family's property. It was a little creepy up there at night, but that was a feature, not a bug as we were the sort of kids that liked to scare ourselves for fun. Before we headed out into the woods with our gear, my cousin Jill has the bright idea to pop a bag of microwave popcorn to bring along for a snack. The hike into the woods is not a long one, so the popcorn is still pretty hot by the time we set up the tent and dump it from the bag into a big plastic bowl. The first hour or so is pretty uneventful. We were sitting in the tent, telling creepy stories, painting each other's nails. It was like a weird mix of a camping trip and a slumber party. I should probably add that it's mostly my cousins that are doing these things, and I'm mostly sitting on the periphery, feeling sorry for myself because I'm still so upset about this boy. As soon as it got completely dark out, the noises start. It takes us a minute to figure out what it is, and when we do, we are a little alarmed. We had pitched our tent in a clearing next to a battered old fence post that was sticking out of the ground, and the noise we are hearing is a succession of tiny rocks or pebbles striking that fence post. Someone is out there in the woods, throwing rocks at our tent, trying to get our attention. This freaks us out a bit, because we are five teenage girls on our own in a tent out in the middle of the woods at night, and it dawns on us how vulnerable we are. My cousins call out, Who's there? And the barrage of pebbles stop for a moment, then resumes. After a few minutes, we decided that the culprit is probably our older boy cousins, who must have followed us into the woods and are just trying to scare us. We all agree that of course is the explanation, so if we ignore them, they will get bored and go away. At about this time, I was so emotionally and physically exhausted that I somehow managed to crash out. My cousins stayed up and that, they later told me, is when things got really weird. The rock stopped completely, and they started to hear heavy footsteps circling the tent. Whatever was out there was also making strange noises, grunts and groans and growls. One of my cousins finally works up the courage to unzip the tent flap a little and peer out with her flashlight in hand. She sees a dark and very tall shape moving among the trees surrounding the clearing, Whatever it is, it's huge, and she is no longer convinced that it's our boy cousin screwing with us after all. So my cousins, sweet girls that they are, decide to leave me sleeping in the tent while they make a run for it back out of the woods into my aunt's house to get help. They zip the tent flap up carefully behind them, like that is somehow supposed to protect my sleeping self from whatever boogeyman is out there. Then they hightail it out of there. Thanks, bitches. I am awakened about 20 minutes later by Jill shaking me while shouting in my face, Tara, oh my god, Tara, are you okay? I am groggy and annoyed and can't imagine why she is freaking out. But even before I am fully awake, a pungent odor assaults my nostrils. The entire tent reeks of some sort of huge animal. It's difficult to describe, but it almost reminded me of the tiger cage at the zoo. I ask my cousins what that horrible smell is. This upsets them even more. Then one of my other cousins starts screaming, Oh my god, the popcorn! Look at the popcorn! And I am even more confused. It was a few minutes before they had calmed down enough to tell me what happened. Apparently, when they returned to the tent, armed with one of my uncle's shotguns and a couple of baseball bats, they found that the tent flap had been unzipped. They immediately jumped to the conclusion that I had been abducted or murdered by a creeper in the woods. But no, there I am, still snoring away, but the tent reeks like an animal, dirt has been tracked in, and is all over our sleeping bags. And the popcorn, that big plastic bowl of buttery popcorn, is completely gone, not even a single unkept carnal is in the bowl or anywhere around it. 
We noped out of there and spent the rest of the night at my aunt's house, but we didn't get much sleep. The next morning, in the hopes of finding a rational explanation, we casually asked my aunt if the boy cousins were around last night and if they went up in the woods at all. My aunt said, no, they weren't even here. They had all gone to some concert in a nearby town and spent the night with friends. They didn't even arrive home until later that afternoon. I've always been fascinated with paranormal phenomena, so it really chaps my ass that probably the closest I've ever came to literally touching something otherworldly, I was passed out cold. Some unidentified creature sat next to me in the tent eating popcorn, and I literally slept right through it, and all because I was upset about some douchebag boy. So I guess the moral of the story is, don't dwell too much on the past, because it just might cause you to miss out on some really interesting stuff that is going on in the present. I never told anyone this story before. I guess you could say it's one of my deepest, darkest secrets, and that ugly skeleton in my closet. The story takes place around nine years ago, when I was six years old. My parents divorced when I was very young, and of course, separated. I live with my mother and visit my father on vacations, especially summer vacation. Some background about where my father lives, please bear with me. He lives a few states away from me in a town that's very, very small, literally. The population is about 782 people, and most, if not all, residents are over the age of 75, so pretty harmless, right? That's what I thought. My father's neighbors were a married couple that came over from the UK. They were in their late 40s, early 50s. For the life of me, I cannot remember the wife's name, but I do remember that she was a lady who loved to gossip and talk smack about others. Her husband, on the other hand, was named Richard. Rich had issues. He was a sick and deranged man, but at the time, we didn't know that. No one did. Everyone in town kind of brushed the couple off. They weren't unnoticeable, but they also weren't in the spotlight. They were just there. But for some reason, Rich was on my father's radar. My father has a killer intuition which is almost never wrong. He told me very, very sternly to stay away from that house. More pointedly, Rich. This struck me as odd because my father was hardly a serious man. He's extremely happy-go-lucky, witty, always cracking jokes and just a delight to be around. But I was only six years old and very naive. Not listening to him was my first mistake. Because the town was so small, everyone knew each other. There was no worry for my dad to allow me to get on my Barbie scooter and ride to the church and back. The church is not far at all, it's about five houses down. Additionally, everyone was friends with my dad and knew about me being his daughter. Along with him, I was relatively liked as well. Seeing me go up and down the sidewalk to the church and back to my dad's house was not a rare sight. I essentially did it every day and my father always told me if I ever ran into trouble, just holler and he'd come running. The only problem with riding was I had to pass Rich's house going to the church and coming back. This was mistake number two. Now, please believe me when I say I don't remember quite how all this happened. I was six and deep down I feel I've suppressed this incident to the point where I've forgotten certain details. Rich was outside of his house, sitting on his patio, Thinking back now, I believe he'd been waiting for me to pass by. He somehow coaxed me into his house. I think Rich had promised me that I could pet his dog or that he had cookies or something. Me being seriously naive and trusting everyone in town, and just in general idiotic, I foolishly trusted him. That was mistake number three. I should address right here and now that yes, I was taught about stranger danger and everything like that. I shouldn't have gone in, I know. I regret it every day. I was also taught early on about what areas my body no one was allowed to touch, and if someone did, I was supposed to run away immediately and if that wasn't an option, call for help. Anyways, as soon as I entered his home I felt an unpleasant sensation overcome me, but I stupidly shook it off. Another red flag was the fact that when his wife laid eyes on me, she swiftly turned the other way and left the room, going upstairs. 
I didn't think much of it because I was taking in the scenery of his home and noticed he had bugs in his glass cases. Besides being a certified asshole, I suppose he was also a taxidermist. I'd never seen anything like it before and inquired about it. And then everything happened so fast. He'd pulled up a chair and made me sit in his lap. I was growing uncomfortable and didn't know how to excuse myself without being rude. And then his grubby hand began rubbing my thigh to the point where he'd lifted up my shorts and commented on the color of my underwear. Even though it's been nine years, I could still recall that part because I would later throw them out. They were yellow with red polka dots. I suppose the intelligent and rational side of my six-year-old brain finally kicked in because I sprang off of him and bolted out the door. I thought for sure he'd follow me, but he stood on his patio watching me run to my father's house and on his face was a sickening smile that has burned into my brain. When I got into my father's house, my dad had been cooking our dinner and had asked me if my ride to the church had been good. I nodded profusely and quickly headed to my room and locked myself in there for the rest of the night. I refused to come out and eat and told my dad I wasn't feeling well, which wasn't a complete lie. I never told him, and I'm not entirely sure why. It's just, I don't know. I can't even give the excuse of how I was six, because I am now 15 and I still haven't told him. I'm embarrassed, highly ashamed and still clearly distraught over this. I should have told my father because I know for a fact he would have beat Rich to a bloody pulp. But wait, this sadly isn't where the story ends. This horror story gets worse. While I type this I'm starting to cry because of the obvious guilt, shame, and enormous regret but before I get ahead of myself, let me continue. A few years later, when I was about nine or ten, I saw a girl a bit younger than me, maybe seven or eight, cutting across my father's field into Rich's yard. I had never seen this girl before, so I stopped and asked her where she was going and why. She said she was going to visit Rich because he was like her uncle and loved him as if he was blood related to her. My heart hammered against my chest and all I could think of is what happened four years earlier. Just hearing his god-awful name made me look over to his house and I saw him in the window, staring at us with a deranged smirk. I turned to the little girl and tried my best to explain to her that Rich was a bad, bad man and that she should stay away from him at all cost. I desperately tried to explain he was dangerous but she said he couldn't be because he was so nice to her. This little girl wouldn't have any of it, and kept insisting that she loved him and he was her uncle. I didn't know what to do. I was stuck. I couldn't explain the concept of being touched inappropriately to a little girl who wouldn't understand it, or accept it, and I couldn't tell my dad because I didn't want him to know about what happened with me and Rich. I told her once more, very sternly, that he was a bad man, she should go home and never go back, but she refused to listen. Looking back now, I should have figured out her address, grabbed her hand and walked her home. If I had a second chance, I would have brought her to her mother and I would have explained to her mother that Rich is a pervert. But I was still so young, naive and in denial. I think about this almost every day and live in constant regret and guilt because I later found out the next summer that Rich had raped that little girl. That little girl and her mother had been new in town. After Rich had raped her, they instantly moved out. Rich was sent to prison and his wife moved back to the UK. I would give up anything to take it all back and change what happened. I would give any amount of money, any of my organs, years off my life or just my life in general just to go back and make things right. I royally fucked up, big time, and it costed a little girl her innocence because I wasn't smart enough to do something. I couldn't overcome my own personal problems, which can't even compare to her in the slightest, and help her. I carry this burden, guilt, and shame with me every day, and the saddest part is, I can't even remember that poor little girl's name. So please, take the time out to educate your children, your nieces, nephews, your neighbors, the children you babysit, the children you teach, the dangers of strangers, places they should never be touched by a stranger, and for the love of everything, to always, always, always report anything. The five minutes it takes to explain these concepts could seriously change the world. It could save a child a lifetime of pain. So rich. Let us never, ever, ever meet again. Even though I didn't want to disclose where my father lives, 
I wanted people to know that Rich is serving a mandatory 15 years in prison, but the time can and most likely will be more because there were other little girls he touched inappropriately. Here are some articles for those who are interested. Also, thank you to everyone that posted. At the current time, I'm still not comfortable with telling anyone, and maybe one day I will be, and I don't think I really need therapy. I've always been a strong person, and even if I was to get therapy, I'd feel terrible burdening my mother because she'd have to pay for it. But seriously, thank you guys. I really needed to get this out there, and the responses have been so uplifting. But I think I'll always hold myself responsible, even if it wasn't my fault. Hey guys, thank you all for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button and join the Nightmare Army. I'm always looking for new soldiers in my Nightmare Nation. So, of course, I want to give Muffin Moon a big thank you for helping me out with this video. Thank you so much, man. And if you guys haven't, please check out Muffin Moon's channel. I definitely think you guys will like him. So anyways, guys, how's everybody's day been? My day has consisted of editing and American Horror Story. I'm watching season 4 at the moment, and I'm not gonna lie, this is probably one of the most... I don't know, this season just really isn't... <sighs> There's so much shit going on. <laughs> I mean, I love the first season, I love the second season even more. Third season was good, but... Eh. Fourth season, it's just like... Okay, what's going on now? <laughs> I haven't seen Hotel yet, but uh, I've heard nothing but bad things. <laughs> a lot of bad things. What do you guys think about American Horror Story? And uh, what's your favorite season in American Horror Story? Let me know down below in the comments, and I hope you guys enjoy the video. As always, guys, thank you all for watching, and just remember, the best ideas always come out of nightmares.